So it is one that we do chant in addition to the mitta. It's a good practice to have. I used to practice this a lot as a layman driving in the crazy, busy streets of Los Angeles where you have road rage, where you have cars going all around you. So as you're driving, you don't have to be driving, by the way. You could be standing at the bus stop and you would have some angry people, perplexed, frustrated people around you, upstairs, downstairs. Without them knowing, you could send them metta. They won't know what hit them, as they say. They, don't, they will not know why all of a sudden they're feeling so good. Secretly, you're sending them metta. So, we do it in the six directions, meaning you might have heard me say ekam disang paritava viharati tata dutiyang. So ekam means one, in one direction. Tata dutiyang, the second, in this direction. And in the tatiyang, in the back, and then chatu, the fourth direction. And then you do up, down, all around like a belt, and then like a sphere like the globe. So, um, you don't have to practice that. I'm just letting you know of how far you can take this metta practice. Remember, in the Karaniya Metta Sutta, Lord Buddha says very clearly in the ending of the Sutta how the person who practices metta, well, will never enter any womb again they will never come back to any kind of birth, any mother's womb ever again. Not bad when you're trying to get rid of suffering. Remember, Nibbana has many titles. One of them is the deathless Amata. It's also the birthless. Birthless, meaning there's no birth. So, today's sutta, I had selected a, a series of suttas for both June and July. And I already have selected for the August month, but uh, as far as the ones that, well, for today's, let me just talk about today's. It's the Chula Gosinga Sutta. It is a beautiful sutta. Because you will see the life of bhikkhus as they're supposed to be. Bhikkhus who lived at the time of the Buddha. Now, this was the ideal life of bhikkhus, but at the same time, it talks about harmony. It talks about living with understanding and appreciation while you are working towards the goal of the holy life. So this sutta is, has a very close relationship with two other suttas. So one of them is the Anuruddha Upakkilesa Sutta. Upakkilesa means the uh, corruptions of the mind. That's one way of looking at it, corruptions of the mind. And in the suttas we have uh, 11 different, uh, which is very closely related with this sutta in the sense that there's a repeat of the situations where Lord Buddha is visiting these specifically three bhikkhus, namely Venerable Anuruddha, Venerable Kimbila, and Venerable Nandiya. These were bhikkhus that you see them um, together they were companions in the holy life, monks. And in these suttas you will see how, well, we're going to cover only one of them today, which is the Chula Gosinga Sutta. Gosinga is the forest, sal tree forest. We have a sal tree downstairs. 
right next to the Bodhi tree, a beautiful tree. If you've seen the buds of it, the smell of it, it was the very first time that I actually smelled it when I first came here. And it was just blew me away how kind it is, how beautiful it is. <laughs> and uh, Gosinga also comes from uh, the, the name of the forest, because if you notice the salt trees, some salt trees have branches that stick out to the side like a, like a horn, like a horn. In India, that, in those days, they would call it Gosinga, uh, the name of the forest, because it looked like somebody resembled it to the horns of a cow. So that's where the name comes from in Pali. So it was called the Saltri Gosinga Forest, where this is uh, taking place, this sutta today's that we will cover. So chula means small, as opposed to maha, which means great. Chula Gosinga Sutta, because there's another sutta that's called the Maha Gosinga Sutta. So when we talk about the chula, we're not talking about the size of the forest. No, we're talking about the size of the discourse, the sutta itself. So this sutta is relatively shorter than another of its namesake, which is the Maha, the bigger version. The contents are different. It's simply the Gosinga part that they want to distinguish. So Chula Gosinga versus Maha Gosinga Sutta. And you will have so many different suttas like this throughout the Nikayas, Chula versus Maha. So we also have a reference to the happenings, the environmental situations, the story, the background story that was going on also in the Mahavagga, which is in the Vinaya Pitaka, number, in the Mahavagga 10th uh, chapter. And then we also have this in the uh, Venerable Anuruddha's Mahavitaka Sutta uh, of the Anguttara Nikaya, where Lord Buddha visits Venerable Anuruddha to encourage him to practice based on the eight qualities. Uh, Venerable Anuruddha points out seven qualities of a great man, Mahapurisa. And then Lord Buddha comes and says, very good Anuruddha, but you seem to have forgotten number eight. And that is where he talks about the Nippa Pancha, not to have mental proliferations diversity of concepts. You know, when you see something outside, something happens to you and all of a sudden your mind goes overdrive and it starts coming up with different thoughts, different memories, all associations. They just spread out like a nuclear explosion, proliferation. We do that all the time. A great being stays away from that. So you have control over what the mind is doing. You choose your thoughts if you want to have a thought. Papanchas are the mental proliferations that normally most beings are lost in. So a great being does not have those papanchas. That's why we call them nippapancha. So that was the third sutta that is related to the story, the background, and similarities of at least the contextual elements of this sutta that we will cover today. So the Gosinga forest is actually on the eastern bamboo grove in uh, near the city of Rajgir or Rajagha in the suttas are called. Today it exists. Rajgir, if you go to uh, India, it's a, it's a lovely city. It's an old city. And many of the suttas uh, that we have in the Nikayas, many of the incidents, they actually have happened in the city of the royal city of Rajgir. Rajgir means royal city. Rajas, you know, the you know, city. And it goes uh, back in time. So many important events have taken place in the city of Rajgir, in the Buddhist uh, dispensation. So, having shared those uh, thoughts uh, with you, I would like to also fill you in as to what has happened here. Lord Buddha first goes to meet 
these three monks that I mentioned, Anuruddha, Nandiya, and Kimbila, at an earlier incident, the one that I mentioned in the Upakilesa Sutta, there Lord Buddha approaches them and says, how are you living? Bhikkhus. So Lord Buddha goes to meet these three bhikkhus and he is asking them in that sutta, how are you doing? Are you getting enough of your requisites, your food, your robes, your alms food, your medicine, your dwelling? And they say, yes, Bhante. How are you? The next question is very important. How are you living together? Three of you. Not that many. Just three monks living together in the vast forest. And he asks them, are you living harmoniously? Are you living in unison, in unity, in comfort, blending like milk and water? Have you ever mixed water and milk together? What happens? Do they stay separate? They mix beautifully. You can't tell them apart. So he asks them that beautiful question. And they say, yes, Bhante, we are, we are doing fine. And then he says, he asks them, are you going um, uh, in your practice deeper? Are you practicing resolutely, keenly, ardently? Are you deliberately following the instructions? And are, have you reached a deep states of mind? And they say, Bhante, we are practicing diligently, we are practicing ardently, but, this is Anuruddha, Venerable Anuruddha is talking, we have not gone deep. Every time we go deep, something happens and we just get kicked out of that state. We lose that peace. And that's where Lord Buddha gives them the 11 upakilesas to overcome. So that is one sutta. So now you see them still struggling. Then we have the Chula Gosinga Sutta, which is today's. So Lord Buddha comes and you're going to see him asking the same questions. Are you getting your food and everything? Are you living comfortably, harmoniously together? And you'll see their answer. But it's interesting why. Because something had happened in the city of Kosambi. It's a very important event that has taken place in the Sasana's life, in the Sangha's life. There was a major argument, quarreling, in fact, fighting was going on between bhikkhus. They were calling each other name, names, they were being harsh to each other. They were starting to break away the Sangha, break it into pieces. And Lord Buddha tries to intervene. And they pretty much say, old man, one of them actually came and said that, old man, you keep out of it. You're the king of the Dhamma. You go and stay in your high, deep, jhanic experiences in your Arattapala. You just go in peace. We will take care of this. Imagine someone saying that to Lord Buddha. They did. Talk about disrespect to one's teacher, let alone Lord Buddha himself. So anyhow, this is happening after. That's why the Lord Buddha is going there to actually check to see, how are you guys living together in harmony? Are you? And we will see now. So I wanted to just give you, fill you in on the background just to get an idea. And I will go ahead and touch on some areas as needed. So this is the Chula Gosinga Sutta, and it is from the Majjhimanikaya, the middle length discourses, number 31. Majjhimanikaya number 31. And this is my translation. Uh, so, Chula Gosinga Sutta, the shorter discourse in Gosinga. I personally heard this, and that is from the Pali we get Evam Me Sutan. And who is that saying it? At the beginning of most suttas, we hear that, Evam Me Sutan. Venerable Ananda. Very good. 
Remember the first council? That is why we have it, because uh, Venerable Ananda was asked by Venerable Mahakasapa and he said, yes, I remember that. I have personally heard this. Either he witnessed it himself or heard it from Lord Buddha himself, because that was one of the conditions for Venerable Ananda to accept the community's invitation or request that he becomes Lord Buddha's attendant. He said, Bhante, with all due respect, I will become your attendant if these conditions are met. One of them was, if he was busy during the day for some reason, where he was not present to the discourse when the, when the sutta was being taught by Lord Buddha, Lord Buddha agreed, based on that condition, to later in the day, no matter how tired he was, before the night was over, to retell the whole sutta to Venerable Ananda. So he would get a private audience. <laughs> but he did not do this out of his narcissism or ego or something like that. No. None of the conditions he, had, he asked for from the Lord Buddha were in any sense egocentric. No, his intention was that he could put that in his photographic memory. He could remember it and he could replay it back when the time was called for, meaning the canon was going to be put into place, the suttas. That was his intention. So that's when we hear Eva Me Sutang, that's Venerable Ananda saying it in the first council, and here we go. We know that it is. Th later on, we have Mahayanis in the five, six centuries later using that same formula to trick readers into thinking that, yes, yes, this is also what Lord Buddha said. Meanwhile, it has nothing to do with it because it didn't happen. Historically, it never happened. But the formulas were used to trick readers into thinking that, ah, okay, so this must also be true, but that's not it. That requires another talk all on its own. <laughs> so, I personally heard this. At one time, the Blessed One was living at the brick house in Nadika. In those days, they didn't have brick houses as much as, as mud houses or uh, made with reeds. In fact, in Rajgir, as um, the bus was uh, uh, going through these old villages, it stopped at one point and I looked outside the window and what I saw, I could have easily have been 2,600 years back in time. There was nothing that reminded me that I was living in the 21st century. The houses, you also see the cow dung on the walls where people, uh, each one would be sold for one rupee, I understood, uh, and they would dry it. Uh, the huts, everything was just like, almost like a movie set. It was so, re it was real. And then I looked up and I saw a satellite dish. <laughs> <laughs> so everything else was as if you were back 3,000, 5,000 years. So, uh, and this, this was a known place, a brick house, because you do see it in other suttas where Lord Buddha stayed at times whenever he was in Nadika. It was during that time that the Venerables Anuruddha, Nandiya, and Kimbila were staying together at the Gosinga Sal tree forest, which was donated by the king, donated to the bhikkhus, to ascetics. And it would be donated, but it would also have somebody to guard it, to take care of it, uh, the attendant. Um, then, when it was early more evening, the Blessed One came out from his seclusion and went to the Gosinga Sal tree forest. Now, on seeing the Blessed One coming in the distance, the forest keeper, the attendant, called out to him, Recluse, so the Lord Buddha is approaching the forest, and the attendant saw him, Recluse, Samana in Pali, do not enter this forest. There are three sons of clansmen staying here, seeking and working on their own good. Do not enter and disturb them. Meanwhile, the Venerable Anuruddha heard these words being spoken by the forest keeper, 
who was addressing the Blessed One, and he immediately called out to the forest keeper, Forest keeper, do not stop the Blessed One. It is our teacher whom you're obstructing. He is the Blessed One. Sometimes, well often, we forget that Lord Buddha was a bhikkhu. First and foremost, he was not what we did to him as people, as cultures. Meaning, he was not objectified as a god, as this other entity. For, the, for example, we have hair on his head. Not just any hair, it has to be spiraling in a certain way, in different cultures, in different places, you have different... It's almost otherworldly. You cannot relate to the images and statues and sculptures that we have turned Lord Buddha into. We forget his humanity. That's why you can worship that. But you can't worship the human, right? Most people have a difficulty. But try to imagine what the forest keeper saw. He just saw a bhikkhu, maybe in robes that had patches on it. Lord Buddha at the time, he would still be wearing clothes and rags that were stitched together into robes that he was wearing. Different colors, often similar but still different. They weren't like one blended color. Head shaven. Ah, how can you recognize him now? So when the... And he didn't have a glowing light aura around him walking into the forest. <laughs> he wasn't floating. He wasn't flying in some lotus petals and things in a lotus flower, huge. So he was walking and the forest keeper just saw a person. And he says, no, 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 don't come in, please, because there are three bhikkhus here working on their practice, on their holy life. They are doing something, they're pursuing their own good. Don't interrupt them. And then we hear Venerable Anuruta, who had the Dibba Chakku. He would hear, he would see cosmos. There was no place that were, no places that were hidden from him. If he wanted to, he would know. <laughs> and anything related with Lord Buddha, he would know. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's our master, this is our teacher, this is our Lord Buddha coming. So he immediately stops the forest keeper. And quickly the Venerable Anuruddha addressed the Venerables Nandiya and Kimbila. Come friends, Venerable Ones, our teacher has arrived. Then the Venerables Anuruddha, Nandiya, and Kimbila rushed to greet the Blessed One. As one received his bow and outer robe, the other prepared his seat, and another brought water to the Blessed One for washing the feet. The Blessed One then sat on the prepared seat and washed his feet. Those bhikkhus then paid their respect by worshiping the Blessed One and sat to one side. Then the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Anuruddha by saying, Anuruddha, are you all keeping well? Are you getting your requisites met? And that is what bhikkhus normally would ask each other, should ask each other. Do you have any fatigue owing to any lack in alms food? Because we would normally have to otherwise walk at about a kilometer to find food, to go to supporters' homes, stand in front until food is served. Sometimes, in some uh, different uh, historical uh, time periods within the sasana's life, there have been famines where people, monks, did not have sufficient food. Sometimes they would return back with very little rice or nothing. 
And uh, so it's, it's important because if you don't have food, you cannot live the holy life. So that is pretty much number one. So that's what Lord Buddha is asking. Bhante, this is Venerable Anuruddha saying, we are keeping well. We are all getting our requisites met. We have no fatigue owing to any lack in alms food. I invite you to look at the responses that Venerable Anuruddha is going to give. It's always going to be in the first per person plural, meaning we, we are doing good, we, us, we're doing fine, we. So he is the spokesperson, undesignated, but he designated himself as the person, the responder, the spokesperson on behalf of the other two, all of them. Which will be very interesting at the end of the sutta, you will discover, I'm sure. Very good, Anuruddha. Are you united and in harmony? Amicable, considerate towards and friendly with each other, without having any disputes? Are you like milk and water, blending together? Do you look upon each other with kindly and friendly eyes? Do you know how that feels? When you look upon each other and all you're seeing in the other person's eyes is just kindliness, friendliness. You're safe. You're so safe. Wow! Eight billion people and this person who's looking at you, you're absolutely comfortable. You can go to sleep in front of them and you know you're safe. No one's going to come and stab you or something. Hmm. This was important because what had happened in Kosambi was, well, I'll tell you the story quickly. Um, there was one bhikkhu who was known as a Vinaya master who had uh, eventually these groups started showing up in the sasana in, in months. So some groups said, oh, we are Dhamma masters, we are studiers, the, the, the individuals who study the, uh, the, the suttas and nothing else. We have talked about that in the past where Lord Buddha never designated such things, just people being lazy and isolationist. They just selectively chose, okay, we're just going to focus on the suttas. This group, they focused on the Vinaya rules. That was their life. Okay. So you had another bhikkhu who was a master of the suttas, the Dhamma. So one day this Dhamma master comes over to the Vinaya master's monastery. So they're talking Dhamma, they're both bhikkhus, and they are both at the time of Lord Buddha. How lucky, how fortunate is that? So the Dhamma teacher goes and says, uh, uh, Avuso, in those days monks would call each other Avuso, which is like friend. Uh, where is the bathroom? He had to go and answer nature's call. So he says, oh, it's in the back of this thing, wall or whatever. So the Dhamma master goes and call, you know, answers the call of nature and uh, comes back. Then the Vinaya master goes after him. He comes back, so he goes now. And then he sees that the bucket was turned up with some water left in it. Now, we have a rule where the bucket has to be turned. In those days, you know, it's, it's an outhouse or something. You're doing, you know, you're going and calling uh, nature's call. You're answering it in the forest. But you have, a, you have a, or close to the forest. So you have some water. So you toss that water and then you have to flip it upside down so insects and other animals don't come and, you know, uh, reproduce in it or at least some of them might die, fall in it. So you don't want to create more suffering for other beings. 
The Dhamma master, for whatever reason, had left it. He had emptied it, but there was apparently a little bit more water left in the corners of the bucket. And he had left it normally pointed upwards, so the emptiness, you could see. The Vinaya master sees this and he says, Oh, this is so unbecoming. How could you be a bhikkhu? He doesn't say it to the other. He's just being cordial and the other one leaves and then he calls his students over, the Vinaya teacher. He says, could you believe this, monk? How could you be a bhikkhu and do something so stupid, so silly, so irresponsible? So he starts flaring up his own students against this Dhamma teacher, another fellow bhikkhu. Over what? Over this silly, pointless, as lay people we laugh at it and we should. In fact, bhikkhus should also. To this day you might have some bhikkhus who really hold this as like, yeah, this should be. That's how stupid human beings can be. Whether you're a lay person or a bhikkhu, doesn't make a difference. Stupidity is stupidity. We have to call it like it is. And now those bhikkhus, the Vinaya master's bhikkhus, on their arms round, come across the bhikkhus or the students of the Dhamma teacher in the village. And then they go and sit together at a park and they're eating the alms food. They went from their pindapada, they're now eating lunch, meal time. And one thing leads to another and the Vinaya master's bhikkhus go ahead and say, your teacher, He's so embarrassing. You must be embarrassed by your teacher. And you say, why? And all of a sudden, lo and behold, you see what happens. And there's a fight now. There's arguments. Your teacher, my teacher, your teacher, this, this, this. And now there is argument, disputes, fights break out. And now the, the news spreads into the, each individual monasteries. And now the teachers are involved. And now they are bickering. And now the fire is getting bigger and bigger. This is called the event in or the dispute or the quarreling in the city of Kosambi. This is where we have an example of the breakup of the sasana in the Sangha. And we have a wonderful uh, verse, Vagga, in the Dhammapada where Lord Buddha uh, goes and tries to talk to them because this is unbecoming as bhikkhus, this is foolish, this is what are lay people going to say? Come on, put these aside. This is embarrassing. This is unbecoming. Bhikkhus shouldn't be like this. You should be unified. And they say, no, 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 Bhante, you go over there. We'll take care of this. And Lord Buddha goes and puts his kuti in order, takes his bowl, his outer robe, and he closes the door and he stands in his doorway and he says some words which we have in the Dhammapada. If you recall the words, he abused me, he hit me, he insulted me. All those who hold to such feelings, hatred will never be appeased in their hearts. He abused me, he hit me, he insulted me. All those who do not dwell on such feelings in their hearts, hatred is appeased and their hearts calm down. So those words, and of course it's a longer verse, happened because of this event. So this is Lord Buddha, um, after he, I mentioned earlier about the Upakilesa Sutta, after the Vassa, Lord Buddha, after he met these three monks, as I was saying earlier, when they said, Bhante, we're not going deeper, he gives them the seven, 11 Upakilesa, uh, how to overcome them. So he later went into seclusion, into doing the Vassa uh, Parileya forest by himself, with no human beings around. Only a monkey and an elephant were his supporters, and the devas, of course. So he survived, he didn't die. The monkey would bring him mangoes and honey, that's enough to you know, make a person survive. The elephant would bring him water and things. And after the Vassa, 
Lord Buddha is coming back to Gosinga forest to speak with these three bhikkhus to check on them, to see if they have been growing in their practice. So this is Venerable Anuruddha's response. Bhante, we are united and in harmony, amicable, considerate towards and friendly with each other, without having any disputes. We are indeed like milk and water, blending together, looking upon each other with kindly and friendly eyes. And now Lord Buddha wants to know the trick. He wants to ask them, And how is it, Anuruddha, that you are able to live together in such harmony? He's saying these questions so that later generations could also learn from them. Bhante, this is how I look at it. It is truly such a great gain, such a privilege for me to live with these caring companions in the holy life. It's an honor to be here with these two monks, fellow monks. In this way, whether openly or in private, whether if we are together in the village, Pindapada, or when I am just uh, by myself or with this person in private, I live while engaging in and behaving with bodily actions that are beaming with metta, with loving kindness, towards these venerable ones. I live while engaging in and behaving with verbal actions that are beaming with loving kindness towards these venerable ones. So bodily actions, physical actions, now verbal actions, words. I live while engaging in and behaving with mental actions that are beaming with loving kindness towards these venerable ones. So even my thoughts are full, drenched in metta as I'm thinking about these venerable ones. So I'm not it's not uh, uh, just lip service. I'm not faking anything. I'm not being cordial because society requires me to. Yeah, please go ahead, sit, sit down. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, oh, he always gets that seat. You know, <laughs> we do things like that. You know, like, no, intentionally, deep down, even if somebody were to probe my mind, what is the essence, the nature of my mind? Is it truly metta all through and through? Is it? It's like a bead on a necklace. You know, the necklace, the string goes all the way through the bead. It's like there's a hole in it. It's like that. Mental action is like that. It goes deep. It's not just the superficial side of the bead, the action. Yes, I'm doing something nice. Hey, look at me, look at me. Is the camera on? Is there, Yeah, take a nice shot from here. People do actions these days while making sure there's enough cameras on them. People go and say, hey, uh, look at me, yes, I'm giving you this poor person a bag of food. Yeah, did you take, oh, let's do it again. Let's do it. Hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> People do this and they get many followers on social media and things. That is not <laughs> through and through metta, it's just the superficial part. We know that. So here's saying, no, whether openly or in secret, it's the same thing, Bhante. I often reflect thus, what if I put aside my thoughts, so the thoughts and desires I have in my own heart and just go along with the thoughts and desires of these venerable ones. So I'm putting mine secondary now. So I do just that and forego my own thoughts and desires and instead follow along with those of my dear companions in the holy life. Bhante, in just this manner, we find ourselves to be different in our bodies, but one in our hearts. So it's no longer about me. It's about you. <laughs> and if we're there together, and we're there for the right reasons, you know, I'm not going to wake up the next morning and see these other bhikkhu going and, and building a hut for himself or a palace for himself or leaving the order. Because we're there for, for a reason, for an objective, not to accumulate things. And you'll see how some of the details here that we'll see. Then, uh, Venerable Anuruddha responded, now both the other venerables, 
Both the Venerable Nandiya and the Venerable Kimbala in turn responded to the Blessed One by giving the same reply. So um, it's no point for me to repeat but because it's, it's an actually repeating Venerable Anuruddha's response, word for word. Um, Bhante, in just this manner we find ourselves to be different in our bodies but one in our hearts. Then the Venerable Anuruddha added, Bhante, it is just in this manner that we find ourselves united and in harmony, amicable, considerate towards and friendly with, with each other, without having any disputes. Therefore, we are indeed like milk and water, blending together, looking upon each other with kindly and friendly eyes. You're always ready to say, I forgive you if something happens. You're not blind. People are people. We're going to make mistakes, but we have to acknowledge them. That's what keeps unity. Sometimes I see people say, "No, no, 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 no. Let's, let's. It's okay. It's okay. Just let's, let's forget about this." Whether in families, organizations, work environments, uh, sangha, one of the worst things you do is is to just pretend that this didn't happen. Someone was hurt. You don't just say, yeah, yeah, let's, let's walk it off, forget about it, forget about it. No. We have to at least address it. There's protocols. Every single time that an issue had happened, it didn't matter who it was that was being accused. Even some people had accused wrongfully Venerable Sariputta a few times. Lord Buddha didn't say, well, you can't talk about that about the chief disciple, so you must be... No. Lord Buddha said, okay, go get Sariputta. They get Venerable Sariputta to come and he says, yes, Bhante, what is it? And he says, this bhikkhu is accusing you of something. And Lord Buddha has to have that person openly accuse him because we are trying to find out what happened. He didn't say, forget about it, let's, let's walk it off, let's forget it, let's move on for the sake of something. No, there has to be some form of an acknowledgement and bringing it to the front to see whether this is true. Because it cannot continue. The Sangha cannot continue. A family cannot continue if we just ignore. And that is what I see a lot. People just ignore, thinking that they are taking the high road. They are just being the bigger person. No, we need to see and acknowledge this thing did happen or not with evidence. And we see again and again in the case of, for example, Venerable Sariputta, that he was wrongfully being accused and the person admits it. But there are times when someone did make a mistake and uh, they apologize, like that person apologizes. So you have to forgive, in, in the case of bhikkhus, we must forgive each other if the person is intentionally regretful for having done this. And it is part of the teaching of Lord Buddhas to keep the sasana, the health of the sasana intact and to keep it replenished, vigor, strength, energy, to have it be vibrant. When a person intentionally comes forward and apologizes, it behooves upon the person who was wronged. If the person is intentionally, truthfully apologizing, we will forgive. And that example we get from Lord Buddha himself. He taught us this. He didn't say, well, you hurt me, so I'm not going to forgive you. You don't see that ever. So many times you see the forgiveness happening. If the person intentionally comes forward. What I do see sometimes is people do the wrong thing and they never come forward and they just want to suck it up and just let's forget it ever happened. Well, in English we call that enabling the behavior, the wrong behavior. If it's a child, if it's an adult, if it's an abuser, guess what they will do? They will see that behavior that you said, it's okay, as a green light for them to do it again and even more. 
Now, what did you do? Did you make things better or did you make things worse? Exactly. So there needs to be coming forward. There needs to be an actual dialogue where we have to openly discuss what happened. If someone hurts someone, we have to say, okay, this is not right. And we have to talk about this. We're not accusing. This is what happened. In order for us to move forward, you now have to apologize because what if this happened to you? Would you like it? No, no. Okay. Let's not do that. But in order for us to live in harmony, we need to discuss this. And that is something that we don't see necessarily in the world today, including the Sangha, by the way, I'm sad to say, in many places. Because people are people. But then you have good monks, good bhikkhus who do address this. And those are the ones who are really keeping it alive. Because they go back to the teaching of Lord Buddha, the example that he gave us, And Lord Buddha says, excellent Anuruddha, excellent. And do you live diligently, keenly, ardent, and resolute? Indeed, Bhante, we all live diligently, keenly, ardent, and resolute. And how, Anuruddha, do you all live diligently, keenly, ardent, and resolute? Bhante, after having gone for alms, whoever would return first from the village prepares the seats and sees to it that water for drinking and washing of the feet is available. It wasn't magically going to appear in the buckets, the water. Somebody had to go to the stream or wherever they were collecting the water to carry the buckets back to the, to, to the, to the temple, to the, to the monastery, to the kuti. It might be a few kutis. Um, and uh, so for drinking and washing of the feet is available. So they make sure there's enough water for those, as well as emptying the trash bin. And whoever is the last to return from the village eats whatever is left over if he so desires. Because uh, if sometimes you get a lot of food for one person, you don't immediately throw it away because other bhikkhus might not have been so fortunate as you. So you leave the food there, cover it up, and then the bhikkhus, the other bhikkhus would come. And if they like what you have, they would eat that too, because you offer food to one sangha, one bhikkhu, you offer it for the whole sangha. That's how it is. In all the, the four directions we say. That's why we don't accept things just, hey, thank you, it's mine now. You know, somebody, else. no, it's for the whole Sangha. Unfortunately, it has become more metaphorical, symbolic, and not that real when you're dealing with people because uh, unfortunately some parts of the world, uh, when uh, a group of individuals or Sangha members are offered something, it goes under their name. Symbolically, they say, oh, it's for the whole Sangha in all four quarters, but not necessarily all the time. And that's why I'm a big supporter of supporters who offer something without having the bhikkhu's name on it. Because we're not supposed to own anything. So it's the lay people and your support. Otherwise people are people, unless you're dealing with anagamins or arahans. But otherwise, people are going to, you know, they're going to die, right? Their relatives are going to come out of the woodwork and they're going to say, Oh, this was my uncle's, this vihara, this car, this this, this that. I need my share. I've seen this happen, you know. I've seen this happen. Almost every bhikkhu um, in some countries, uh, like in Sri Lanka, other places, uh, living in the West, they have one or two temples under their name. They're not just the Sri Lankans, by the way, other places too, Burma, Thailand. So there's some, something funny going on there. So we need to be a little bit more cognizant of these factors. So there's the sharing of the food that's left. And so whoever comes last, can share the food. And, uh, and if he does not, 
If, there's, if he doesn't want to eat the food, then he throws it into a barren area. We didn't have refrigerators. We're not allowed to keep food um, in those days especially. Um, so you have to throw it in a barren area, empty area where there's no life. Animals might choke on it or something, animals might die. Um, so a barren area where nothing grows or put in, puts it into some water where no life is apparent, no fish are roaming about. Because if you toss it in there, again, an animal might die from it because of the chemicals or whatever it might be, too much salt, spicy food, something. Uh, then he puts away the seats, the water vessels, and after emptying and washing the trash bin, he sweeps the meal area. What a nice setup. Quiet, three people, everybody's taking care of everybody else. You know, it's like having, instead of two hands, three hands. You know, you have two hands, two arms. One is not going to neglect the other. When you go wash your hands, the other one doesn't stay here and says, oh, you go ahead and deal with the dirt. No, we wash with both hands. It's like that. We take care of each other. Furthermore, Bhante, whoever sees the water vessels used for drinking, washing, or for the toilets running low, he would go and fill them up. And if he finds the buckets to be too heavy to carry, then he calls out to one of the others to come and help him. But he does, he does so with a gesture of the hands. He would not utter or say a single word on account of it. So it's like... Why? They're maintaining noble silence. Have you ever done retreats where we have to keep noble silence? And when the teacher is not there, hey, you know, we're going to do, we start to talk. You lose a lot of energy, but you also gain a lot of energy. You build a lot of momentum when you are maintaining noble silence. Remember, noble silence is not just the one dealing with the mouth, the physical mouth. It starts here. In fact, noble silence happens when you are in the second jhana, to be more precise. Because that's where you don't have vitakka and vichara. Thinking and pondering don't happen there in the mind. Because that's where it starts. Chatter. We talk, 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 talk. Well, it starts in the mind. So by keeping your physical mouth shut <laughs> responsibly, Carefully, you're also facilitating the mind to calm down and to become quiet. That's what you're doing because, and then the mind becomes more and more still. Because obviously it's, it's easy for you to see, oh, the bucket is empty, there's two buckets, I can't carry it. Oh, there's Kimbila, there's Nandia, okay, Nandia, come. No. But that requires Sati. To stop that urge immediately in the spot and say, wait, 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 noble silence. Okay. And then the same thing, they would come and they would help you. So, furthermore, Bhante, uh, so uh, we maintain noble silence during the week, except for every fifth day where we sit together throughout the night discussing a topic on the Dhamma. How lovely is that? Once a week they come together to discuss the Dhamma all night under the stars. <laughs> Lovely. Because during the week you might have had experience. They're not talking about their experiences. Be careful. This is something that I warn my meditation students about. Sometimes people like to talk about personal experiences. So this is what's happening to me. What do you think? Do you think I'm in the first jhana? Do you think I'm in the second jhana? Oh. It starts flaring up. Too much restlessness, envy, jealousy, all kinds of nasty things show up. Ah, dhamma. That's not dhamma. What they're talking about here is discussing the dhamma. Let's say one of them would turn to Kimbila. What do you think Lord Buddha meant in this sutta? Oh, 
I think he meant this. I mean, he meant that. So that's how the discussion. So you're not talking about your personal attainments, experiences. Somebody might say, well, Anuruddha, I don't know how you deal with restlessness. Any suggestions? That's still not talking about your experiences. You're asking for help. And that's what spiritual, that's what Kalyana Mittaya does. We help each other, but we don't pick up the phone and say, you're not going to believe which jhana I walked into today. <laughs> no. You could say, oh, in the sutta that I was reading, I was listening to, I just had an idea. What do you think? That's still not talking about experience. That is talking about the Dhamma because what we say influences others. And that's how we grow. It's like putting one candle next to another candle that's lit. Now the room that was dark got lit up with one candle. Now there's two. Now there's three, four, five. Imagine the whole room full of candles. That is what you're doing when you're discussing the Dhamma. Because your Kalyanamitta might say something, suddenly it would go, <gasps> something that you had been struggling with, all of a sudden you have an aha moment. And then you can't, you're itching to go back and sit. Because sometimes even with, you know, after one of them can be talking about the Dhamma, you're just like, you go into the practice immediately. So, uh, if, and if he finds the bucket is too heavy, so calls out to the others, oh, so we maintain noble sense during the week, etc. Bhante, in this manner we all live diligently, keenly, ardent, and resolute. Excellent, Anuruddha, excellent. And while living diligently, keenly, ardent, and resolutely in this manner, have you attained to any superhuman levels of knowledge and vision? Jnana dasana. And uh, worthy of the noble ones? Have you attained any state that is worthy? Anything that is superhuman in a sense? Uh, as a result of meditative and peacefully contented living? Of course, Bhante. We attain to such superhuman levels indeed. For whenever we desire, whenever we want, while being secluded from sensual desires and wholesome, unwholesome thoughts, we all can enter upon and abide in the first jhana. Notice, we all abide. We can enter at will. And, you know, the first jhana, he says, which is accompanied by thinking and pondering. Vitakka and Vichara, I said. In the first jhana, you have them. You're still thinking, you're still seeing, you have thoughts, perceptions, ideas, images, they're there. But there's so much joy. You feel it in every single pore, every single tiny little centimeter square, you feel it. Your hair feels like all, your body feels goosebumps, goose flesh. And your heart feels like it's going to burst with joy. And there's no reason for it. Nobody came and told you something great, something wonderful. It just blossoms in your heart. And as you go in your metta practice, if you're doing it right without changing anything, you will start to experience some of these things. Just saying. <laughs> Bhante, this is one such superhuman level of knowledge and vision worthy of the noble ones, which we have each attained as a result of meditative and peacefully contented living. Excellent, Anuruddha, excellent. But have you attained to any superhuman levels of knowledge and vision that are beyond this peaceful state? Of course, Bhante, we have. This is in contrast to the Upakilesa Sutta, where they were saying, yeah, we are resolute, but... Every time we go deep, it's like we're getting kicked out of the meditation. So here in this sutta, obviously they have been practicing according to the, according to the uh, teachings that Lord Buddha had given them to overcome the corruptions, corruptions of the mind. And what are the corruptions of the mind? 
uh, roughly speaking, think of them as the five hindrances. Pancha Nivarana, uh, where you have uh, uh, sensual lust, Kamma Chanda, you have Vyapada, ill will, you have uh, Tinhamida, sloth and torpor, you have restlessness and worry, remorse, Uddacha Kukucha, you have uh, skeptical doubt, Vichikicha, and then you have them more spread out, you have other things as well. Uh, so, such as not being or uh, slackening in your effort, too little effort, uh, unpredictable effort, or too much effort, you're grasping onto the practice too much, or being so mesmerized, always looking at your phone, trying to find, okay, what's the next, next update, what's, or seeing things, I want to see things. In meditation, you want to open up your eyes and look around, what's their color, shape, anything new? I noticed this years ago when I was doing chankama, walking meditation, and my eyes kept on wanting to look above, you know, about five feet up, and try to look at what was on the walls. All of a sudden, these photographs on the walls seemed like it was a life and death situation. I had to look at them. I said, why? What happened? It's boring, is that it? The mind was very interested in anything other than being on its object of meditation. Anything, give me anything. A dot on the wall is very important for me to look at. A dot, a mosquito, uh, uh, anything. A stain on the ground, all of a sudden your eyes go there. Why? 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 So that requires strong sati which opens the door for panya to happen. Remember that. I always give the image of a car that's being driven with the lights on in the pitch darkness. The light is sati. But you need the steering wheel, don't you? That is panya. Because what good is the light in the darkness if you can't control where the car goes? So that is panya. That is the thing which controls the direction of where you're going to go. So, uh, where was I? Okay. So Lord Buddha is going to ask them, have you gone beyond this? You're going to see this again and again. Have you gone beyond this state? Beyond this state? So I don't want to repeat all those, so um, at least Lord Buddha's part, but I will uh, point out the things that uh, Venerable uh, Anuruddha is saying. Of course, Bhante, we attain to such superhuman levels that go beyond this peaceful state, uh, for by leaving behind both thinking and pondering, vitakka and vichara, going beyond, we can enter and dwell in the second jhana, where the heart becomes internally stabilized and tranquil and is brought to a single point, ekagata. Eka means one, coming to the same point, which brings with it joy and pleasure that is the result of the collectedness of mind. I don't use the word concentration because it is inappropriate to use for samadhi. Collectedness of mind is more fuller in its meaning. Same goes with stability of mind, more acceptable term than concentration. Bhante, this is another superhuman level of knowledge. And then he goes, uh, Lord Buddha asked him, have you had anything more than that? Uh, so you can see him as a proud teacher wanted to make sure that, okay, did you get deeper than this? And deeper than this? Deeper than this? Of course, he can just scan their minds and see where they are. But he also, that doesn't help us. Those of us 2,600 years later reading the sutta. So we need to read step by step way of Lord Buddha unraveling. And then what? Did you go deeper than this? Did you go deeper than this? It's like a, almost like a, a proud parent, you know? He says, of course, Bhante, we attain indeed to such superhuman levels. Uh, as you guessed it, he's now going to talk about the third jhana. Uh, for as equanimity grows within the mind, and the joy subsides, we can abide dispassionate for as long as we like, but mindful and fully aware as we experience the soothing relaxation within the body. 
Thus we enter upon and abide in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, mindfully, one abides equanimous, experiencing happiness throughout. Bhante, this is another superhuman level. So, some people ask about the jhanic factors, um, specifically about upekka, for example. PT is another, another factor, of course. Um, is one better than the other, or um, does that, let's say, upekka, does that happen after? The answer is no. Upekka is there from the start. It's just that it's not as loud as pronounced as piti. Happiness, sukha, is also there. Ekagata is also there. So these factors are there, but what is happening is there is this quietude happening and more of ek, uh, upekka coming to uh, become more pronounced in the person. Why? Because your noise is settling down. Have you ever looked at, well, you're old enough, I think, to remember TV, television. In the old days, when you didn't have all kinds of broadcast stations, sometimes you would look and you had to arrange it in a certain way, so there's a lot of static microwaves until you would get the right you know, bandwidth or something. That's what's happening. And you're calming it down. That's why we need to practice longer and longer and more and more often. So you start to understand the tricks of your mind and how your mind over time has a more of a preference to noise. But so long, the noise could be even joy. That's what I'm trying to say. Because you will not be able to experience the full length, the depth of upekka, equanimity, in the presence of such joy. Because joy itself creates restlessness. Flutters. <laughs> when you're experiencing the first jhana, you're experiencing the first jhana. You're not going to be experiencing the fourth jhana. Unless you allow the mind to settle calm down. So you have to be very patient with yourself. That's why you cannot allow the mind to become um, remorseful. That's why one of the first things I say people, if they break a precept, please don't keep uh, judging yourself, dragging the remorse behind you. How could I have broken that precept and my teacher always is going to think about me? Da, 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 oh, would you do it again? No, Bhante. Okay, okay, don't take the precept again. Drop it. Drop it quickly. Okay, okay, they feel good. Now they don't have to struggle and fight. Restlessness is gone. Restlessness is one of the strongest fetters that will be with us, even if you become an anagami. It's still there. Before you become an arahant, restlessness will be dropped. Not while you are still any of the other levels of awakening. That's how deep it is. That's why we have to really calm the mind down. That's why we need to practice as often walking meditation, sitting meditation, in all the four postures of the body. So, um, so Upekka is there already. But now in the third jhana, it really comes out. You can feel it. You're washing the dishes. Suddenly your mind goes, hmm. It's like, okay. I usually would get to this point when I'm sitting in a retreat for six days, but this is interesting. Oh, what I tell meditators is don't waste that beautiful opportunity. If you can, go find a place to sit. Leave whatever you're doing, because that is a rare, beautiful opportunity. Take it, <laughs> because that might be your invitation to take you to the fourth jhana. Because Upekka is coming, knocking on your door and saying, Hey, I'm here. And this is when uh, Lord Buddha asks him, Okay, have you gone any deeper? 
He says, yes, Bhante. And of course, Bhante, by going beyond that peaceful state, we attain to higher superhuman levels of knowledge and vision by giving up both pleasure and pain. Sometimes people say, oh, I, I, don't, I don't want to let go of the pleasure. I like it so much. That is where they get stuck on the first and second, even the third jhana. You have to look at them as just passing because you cannot have pleasure without pain, ultimately. And this is where we need panya and wisdom, dhamma vichaya, to look. There's this little thing called anicca, remember? There was a time where there was no pleasure. Yeah. Which means now there is pleasure, which means that pleasure is also going to be gone. Anicca. So long as I'm attached to it, that's when I'm going to have dukkha. Hmm. This is where wisdom is going deeper in the mind of the person. You're allowing, there's a trust here. You cannot go into the fourth jhana. In fact, you cannot go into the first jhana without trusting. You can't say, well, I'm going to go into the first, first jhana. And yes, second jhana. Yes, here we go. <laughs> no, it never works like that. There's a lot of humility, a lot of respectful approach, a lot of respectful approach, not to someone else out there, but to the mind, as you are allowing the mind to become trusting of you and saying, okay, let's go deeper. You're not placing demands or expectations. You're allowing the mind to unfold itself. And that's one of the reasons why I also mention how metta is important, especially in this time period. People have lost that connection of trust with themselves, let alone with others. So, uh, by giving up both pleasure and pain and having already gone beyond joy and anguish, opposites, uh, while experiencing neither pleasure nor pain, having now gone beyond them, as we enter into and dwell in the fourth jhana. Bhante, this is yet another superhuman level of knowledge and vision. Uh, some people say there's only four jhanas and uh, other jhanas, the arupa jhana. These are the rupa jhanas, by the way, form-based uh, jhanas, uh, form realm. So, uh, in other places you see the Arupa Jhanas listed as another four. So, um, it's up to interpretation, uh, but usually we see them as separate um, in suttas. I mean, uh, so Lord Buddha asks him again, have you gone any deeper than the fourth jhana? Um, yes, Bhante, uh, by going beyond this, for whenever we desire, Excuse me. By overcoming all perceptions of matter and overcoming memories or mental associations of anger. That was, those are the sanya. Sanyas are, I don't like to translate them as perceptions merely because they're very vague. <coughs> memories really do a number on the mind. They really shake us, memories, thoughts. They don't necessarily have to be memories of a significant time period. It could be just the way you scraped your foot as you were walking down the hallway. That's a memory. All of a sudden you're now thinking about the hallway and now you're gone back to childhood. But that triggered some things. So it starts a chain reaction. So you're not dealing with these objects of perception of form and matter. Uh, of anger. So you're not attached to these emotional entanglements of what has happened to you. This is another way of saying content. People come to me and say, well, Bhante, you don't understand. This is what he did to me. This is what she said to me. Content. I don't care if we're talking about the actual pattern. The pattern is what we're looking for. What is the objective of you sitting to meditate? You're not brooding, you're not planning. Some people think that meditation is planning period. They have their notebooks next to them. Yeah, okay. Well, that's not meditation. That's contemplation. 
You're sitting now planning period. You know, tossing ideas around in your head. That's not meditation. Because you are still a victim of your concepts. And so long as you're there, you're in the Rupa realm. And that's where we're headed here in this explanation. By ignoring and not giving any attention to passing thoughts of this diversity. We don't know where thoughts come from. But we try to control. We try to fight them. Guess what that will do? It will kick us out of the jhana. Because the mind is, is now going to be restless. You're going to fan the flame. Not calm it down. So Upekka is out the door. When you are thinking after this, after this, after... Remember earlier I was saying about papanchas? This is papancha. Diversity of concepts. Uh, so by ignoring, it's called amanasikara. Manasikara means attention, wise attention. You only saw manasikara. Amanasikara means ignoring, the opposite of giving something attention. So you're intentionally ignoring. Sometimes I tell this to parents who have a difficult child, and they always somehow give in to the child's demands. Remember earlier I was saying enabling a bad behavior? And then they come and say, well, I give him what he wanted and, and he still does. Well, what do you think? He's going to do it and he's going to ask more and more every single time. It's going to get worse. So what do you do? Ignore. You're not going to kill the child. <laughs> he's your child. But you're not going to turn and give him attention whenever he wants to. Kicking and screaming. Because that's called negative attention giving. But what? The common denominator is attention. The child is still getting attention. There's positive attention, there's negative attention. So when you're ignoring the child, you look at them once, you don't keep yelling at the child because that means you're now at their level. They're never going to respect you again. You look at the child and say, stop or not even say a word and turn around and do your thing. They're going to do it more because they're used to, because you allowed them to. Eventually they're saying, something's different. Something's different. And then you say, if you do this, then I'm going to give you some attention. Positive. And the child would get to do something. Clean this place. Clean your room and I will show you some kindness. And the child might go ahead and do that, clean that area, and now you have to own your word and say, that was beautiful, Johnny. That was beautiful. I'm proud of you. You just introduced his brain to what it feels like to get positive, good attention. So now the neurons are going to work overtime in his brain to rechange, to, to, to recalibrate themselves so now they're not going to be yelling and screaming. Now they're going to do more good things, good for you and for them, because you know better, because they will be given attention. Now there is the opposite side, which is here is what we are doing. I'm not opposite, but we're trying to do the same thing with the thoughts. If you have a ten tendency of thinking about negative things, the more you try to fight them, hand-to-hand -hand combat, the more it will get worse. Lord Buddha has, a, has an example of, of, he was the master of giving similes. Imagine a stick, a wooden stick, and somebody, there was an excrement on the ground, a dog's or a cow's or a human's excrement, poop. Somebody has a stick and the stick on one end has poop on it. On the other hand, on the other side, there's also poop. And in the middle, it's also smeared with more poop. Whichever way you touch that stick, you're now going to be infected. It's just like, that's going to be on you. Thoughts are like that. Amanasikara, Lord Buddha says. No giving attention to your thoughts.
if you want to go deeper. Don't engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat with your thoughts. That's the advice here. So, passing thoughts of diversity, so by ignoring that, while directing the mind to the boundlessness of space, we have attained to that too and dwelt in the realm of infinity of space. This is the first of Arupa Jhanas. He's going deeper. And then Lord Buddha asks him about the second, next, uh, and he says, Yes, Bhante, we have gone beyond the realm of infinity of space while directing the mind to the infinity of expanding consciousness infinitely expanding consciousness. We have attained to the to and dwelt in the realm of infinity of consciousness. This is now the sixth Arupa jhana, uh, the sixth jhana or the second Arupa jhana. This is where the consciousness feels. Sometimes I have students say, I feel like um, my awareness is expanding. I don't know why, I don't know how, and sometimes if they, this is one of the reasons why the student has to gradually, step by step, do these, go through these processes by a teacher, guiding the student one by one to go so that the mind can actually be relaxing in each of these jhanas, to get ready. Sometimes I give the example of working out in the gym. You don't go ahead and lift a hundred kilogram of dumbbells when you have not worked out, when your muscles can't even lift five kilograms. It's like that. And one of the worst things a person can do is take uh, some drugs. Some people say psychedelic drugs or whatever to all mind-altering drugs. Well, what is that drug going to do? If I take this bottle of water and spill it over my com computer screen, you say, no, 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 don't do that, why? It's just a computer. Yeah, but the computer's brain will be fried. It will be destroyed. Well, unlike the computer, you cannot go to the store and buy another brain. So we have to be very careful what we are doing in, in with the mind and that's why we take the fifth precept as well not to have any intoxicants and, 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 and all kinds of stuff that delude the mind and damage it I say this because now we're living in a world where it is becoming more and more popular even some scientists are pushing for psychedelic drugs mushrooms and things like that that are poisonous to the brain and suddenly, the, because it's irreparable, irreparable. So we have to carefully work with it. And meditation allows us to really go deep and do it safely and have long-lasting impact, effects of it, and develop into even the highest potential for us. Uh, so then Lord Buddha asks him, have you had anything deeper than that? And he says, yes, of course, Bhante. Whenever we want to, by going beyond the realm of infinity of consciousness, while becoming aware that there is nothing, we have attained to and dwell in the realm of nothingness. Um, where there's nothing in the mind. So unless the person wants to have a thought, it's absolutely blank. It's like having walked into a room and there's no furniture. It's very strange for um, us when the mind becomes so calm, there's, there's no thoughts. You're completely aware. Things are just happening in front of you. You're aware of them. You're not a zombie. You're completely present. And somebody comes and asks you a question. You're not dumb. You're not standing there like, huh? No, you immediately will think of whatever needs to be thought about. And that's the end of the story. The question is gone, it's done, you're back into the empty room. But because it's a jhana, this is a time of rest. Whenever we go into jhanas, think of it as a restful way station. They don't take us to Nibbana. They're not Nibbana. If you use them wisely, they can facilitate 
you to experience more and more restful states, just like in the case of realm of nothingness, to get used to what it feels like to have a mind that is absolutely quiet. In that sense, yes, it could allow you to make room for Nibbana to happen, but it itself is not Nibbana. Some people have misinterpreted uh, whoever has gone to this, uh, you know, this level, uh, this deep in experiencing nothingness, they've said, oh, this is the Shunyata, this is that Lord Buddha was talking about, so this is, this is it, I'm there. This is Nibbana, okay, you can call me an Arahant now. No, this is just a jhana. Because the person will come out of it. You don't come out of being an Arahant. <laughs> You're an Arahant. Once an Arahant, you're an Arahant. The mind is totally different from what we understand in, in, in the writings of uh, the reports and the descriptions of Arahants. And of course in the suttas. So then this was the seventh, and now we go to the eighth, because Lord Buddha is asking, have you gone any deeper? And he says, yes, Bhante. For whenever we want to, by going beyond the realm of nothingness, we have attained to and dwelt in the realm of neither perception nor non-perception. It feels like uh, the person will not know they are in this state until they come out of it. You will not know that you are in it while you are in it. You can only know that you were in it after you've come out of it. It's like walking through a, a, a room um, and uh, you come from the other end out and then you realize, what was that? That was it. And then you can remember what happened. So that's why uh, Neva Sanya Nisanya, it's, it's a not, neither perception nor non-perception. At the time of Lord Buddha, actually Siddhartha Gautama, when Lord Buddha was studying um, Uddhaka Rama Buddha, uh, Uddhaka Rama's son, he, uh, his father had died, but his father had taught him, Uddhaka, how to get into the eighth jhana. But he himself had not been able to, but he knew the technique. That technique was taught to Siddhartha Gautama, who later became Lord Buddha. And Lord uh, Siddhartha later on, he just takes the meditation object and he goes and practices and boom, he's in the eighth jhana. He goes back to Uddhaka and he says, excuse me teacher, uh, is, this is what I'm experiencing. <coughs> excuse me. Just a little bit of water. And he says, uh, this is what I'm experiencing, this is how I go into the jhana, this is how I come out, and this is what I've experienced. Is this correct? And Uddhaka says, yes. This is exactly what you're... And he says, this is a wonderful gain, this is wonderful, this is great fortune, because I have not even reached that stage. Uddhaka, my father gave me the technique, I teach it. Nobody here has gotten it. You did it in a very short time. Why don't you teach the whole congregation of students here? He says, no, 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 no. That's not why I'm here. I don't want to be a teacher. It's like, because I still have loba dosa moha. Because even the eighth jhana, despite how supremely, I don't know what it is, I still come out and I still have the ignorance. It's subtle. Probably no one will notice. But I notice, he says. He doesn't use those words, but he says, no, I have to leave. And that's when Lord Buddha goes and, and it pushes himself. Because he says, there's got to be another way. And that's eventually he finds the path of penetrative insight. He goes deep into phenomena. And that's when he finds, understands the three characteristics of existence beyond the jhanas. To this day in the world you have people, you go, not just in India, people still practice around the world. I've seen Buddhist practitioners who reach that stage of eighth jhana and then they start to misinterpret their experiences. 
Remember the statement I shared with you the first day I was here? Trust the behavior, never the words. Always trust the person's behavior, not their status, not their title, not their words. Trust the behavior because it will tell you where the person is, how they function in their hearts, what is in their hearts. Because that's where Loba Dosa Moha is or are. And that's where the Dhamma can be. And these eight jhanas, they're not it. I'm sorry, they're important exercises because they really allow you to expand your experience on this planet. You go beyond what is mere life to you, for you. It expands your ideas about life, experiences. And Lord Buddha asks him, as you guessed it, have you gone deeper? And he says, yes, Bhante, of course. For whenever we want to, by going beyond the realm of neither perception nor non-perception, we have attained to and dwelt in the cessation of perceptions and feelings. Ah. When you hear that statement, when a person has reached the cessation, or they can willingly, intentionally enter, in Pali we call it, uh, uh, sanya Vedaita Niroda Samapatti. Sanya Vedaita that, uh, Niroda, the cessation, the ending of perceptions and feelings. You are dealing with, at the very least, an anagami. So he just declared, Venerable Anuruddha, that the three of them are at the very least anagamis. Because nobody other than an anagami or an arahat can enter into this state. Because sometimes they call this the ninth uh, jhana. Uh, but uh, so basically he just said that. And having seen it for ourselves, oh uh, yes, so and having seen it for ourselves directly in this manner and with wisdom, now you have the word wisdom. Wisdom. That is what this path is based on. Lord Buddha's Dhamma, the sasana, is based on wisdom. Don't forget that. It's not blind worship. Even the faith that we have, the sadha, has to have wisdom in it. Everything. Sila has to have wisdom. Remember that bhikkhu, the Vinaya master? He was simply following the rules blindly. He didn't have Dhamma in his heart. He didn't. He didn't have wisdom, that's why. There is, you know, the rules are there to reduce suffering. That's it. So we don't end up causing pain for ourselves and everybody else, in, in case of the bhikkhu, to keep the sangha safe. That's why we have rules. Don't engage in sexual activities. Don't drink drugs or anything like that. Why? Because if you do, there goes the sangha. Don't keep up pretenses. <laughs> if you're going to do those things, then leave. Disrobe, go. Become a layperson. Fine, there's no shame in that. When I became a bhikkhu, people were asking me, so that's it? You're now, that's it? You've become a bhikkhu and you can't ever leave? It's, like, it's almost like a cult or mafia. I said, no, no, we're not like that. <laughs> Anytime the person wants to, they can go and disrobe if they want to. But think wisely, you know? But there's no like, you know, you can't leave. No, we can if we want to. I think it's stupid if I, you know, but, but that's, that's just me. <laughs> but uh, because this is the noblest of, of, of life. Um, so, um, so he says, uh, um, the, uh, and having seen it for ourselves the, directly in this manner and with wisdom, the mental contaminants, the asavas, that's how I translate them. I don't use influxes or things like that that I've seen or cankers that I've seen sometimes English translators use for asavas. I use mental contaminants. I think we can relate better uh, 
um, cankers, it's like canker sores or something, you know, hepatitis or something, you know, HP virus or something. Um, so, and having seen it for ourselves directly in this manner and with wisdom, the mental contaminants have all been completely destroyed in us. Now he just declared that they are Arahas. Because when we hear that, though, that statement, that the asavas have been destroyed, that means now the person is fully another hunt. Uh, kaya, kaya uh, is elimination, destruction, uh, in this case of the asavas. Bhante, this is yet another superhuman level of knowledge which we have each attained as a result of meditative and peacefully contented living. And then he continues, Bhante, we have not witnessed nor experienced a more peaceful, noble, exalted and superhuman state of being than this. So this is our limit. So he said, this is it. There's nothing beyond that uh, we have experienced than the destruction of the asavas. And now we're going to see Lord Buddha's statement. He says, excellent Anuruddha, excellent, for indeed there is no state of being that is more peaceful, noble, exalted, and superhuman than this. You have reached the apex. You have reached the summit. There's nothing higher. You have released yourself. That's Vimutti, the ending of suffering. They have the deathless in their hearts. Their mission is accomplished. Not bad. <laughs> then the Blessed One encouragingly spoke as he inspired, roused, enlightened the hearts of the Venerable Anuruddha, Nandiya and Kimbila with an enlivening talk on the Dhamma and then he rose from his seat and left. What a proud teacher. He's so happy. You could, I mean, but it's Lord Buddha. Three of your bhikkhus who were struggling before you went into your vasa alone in seclusion in the forest, while the other bhikkhus over there in Kosambi are fighting with each other, a bad example of bhikkhus, you have here genuine hope. Because you have given instructions, and now those three bhikkhus so carefully followed your instructions as good students, and they have tasted the Dhamma. They have tasted the Dhamma. Uh, so the three bhikkhus then accompanied their teacher by following after the Blessed One and stopped short at the entrance of the Sal forest. Because they still have to go back now. They've walked out of respect, walked the Lord Buddha to the end of the forest. It was then after they said goodbye to Lord Buddha, uh, paid their respect, it was then that the Venerables Nandiya and Kimbila both asked the Venerable Anuruddha. This is interesting. Friend Anuruddha, did we ever discuss with you or tell you that we have attained any of these lofty states mentioned, which the Venerable One reported to the Blessed One, up to and including the complete destruction of the mental contaminants? Have we ever talked about this? How do you know? <laughs> And Venerable Anuruddha's response, No, friends, the Venerable Ones have not discussed with me nor told me about those lofty attainments. But I saw the truth of this in my heart as I looked into your hearts. Furthermore, the Devas also informed me about this. And when the Blessed One questioned me on this, I replied by telling the truth of what I personally know. Venerable Anuruddha had the, the bachaku, had the ability to see through. Sometimes people say telepathy, uh, seeing or scanning the minds of others. Uh, it doesn't happen with all arahants. In fact, you don't have to be an arahant to experience this. Uh, but in the case of Venerable Anuruddha, for example, he had this ability before becoming an Arahant. He had the Dibba Chakku. But uh, when he became an Arahant, it really took on a different you know, depth. 
And now you see how beautifully he used it as he gave his testimony to Lord Buddha. Of course, Lord Buddha didn't need to ask him because all he had to do is just look into their hearts like Anuruddha did, Venerable Anuruddha. And, uh, and that's another way of knowing. And you see this also in the suttas where Lord Buddha is reporting something and uh, sharing something uh, that people don't know. And then somebody asks the question, Bhante, how did you know this? And he says, I looked into the mind or the heart of the person. Plus, he says, the devas also informed me. For example, many times where uh, Devadatta was planning something to kill or harm Lord Buddha, the devas would be there to tell, to report. And especially when someone was about to attain awakening, they were very close. The devas would rush to Lord Buddha and say, Bhante, Bhante, uh, so-and-so bhikkhu or so-and-so sa uh, samanera or samaneri uh, is, is really close. Because some devas have the ability to see who's close and who's not. Because for the devas, they are far... Um, our secrets that we keep so dear, hidden, from everyone else, uh, secret thoughts, etc., pure in, or the true intentions. Uh, for the devas, uh, it's transparent; they can see it. And some devas can really go even deeper. Uh, so, um, so yeah. So they can also be the second way of finding out if something is true. So it's like a double uh, measurement. One would be scanning the mind or the heart of the person, and the second would be the, uh, the devas coming and uh, confirming it. Now, uh, so Lord Buddha, meanwhile, is going away. Then the Yakka Diga Bharajana quickly went and approached the Blessed One, and after paying his respects, stood to one side and said this to the Blessed One. Yakkas are not necessarily bad. Sometimes they translate it as demons in English. I don't agree with that. Because you have yakkas that are so full of love and appreciation for the Dhamma. They're, they're so alive with the Dhamma. They're protectors of the Dhamma. Hemavata is one. We have a sutta. I've given, I've given a, a talk on Hemavata sutta. And he was a yakka along with his uh, buddy where they talk about the Dhamma. And uh, their, their conversation is so colorful, lively, full of sadha, that a woman, a human woman, who is standing at her terrace and she's pregnant, who overhears their conversation, she attains sotapatti. She becomes a sotapanna. She's the first sotapanna, in fact. And she never had actually heard Lord Buddha speak. She only heard the Yakkas talk about the Dhamma, who were reporting on the Dhamma Chakka Pavattana, because Lord Buddha was giving the Dhamma Chakka Pavattana discourse. And these Yakkas, one of them, Hemavata, was so excited he had gone to the Himalayas to grab his friend. Say, come, 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 you're not going to believe this. A Buddha has appeared. He's there in Sarnath. Isipatana, he is giving the Dhamma, he's turning the wheel of the Dhamma, come, come. And he says, why? Does he have this quality? His friend. Does he have this quality? He's testing. He's like, yes, yes, he has this, he has this quality. And there's this human woman who's overhearing this conversation. So, uh, and she becomes a noble disciple. She becomes a Sotapanna, just by hearing from a Yakka. So please, when you hear the word yakka, don't think of them in a bad light. Now, of course, there are many yakkas who are demons. <laughs> okay? But let's not throw the baby with the bathwater, as we say in English. Because there's so many protectors who are yakkas, protectors of us and prote protectors of the sasana who are yakkas. And uh, Atanatiya Sutta, for example, has uh, because we have Chatu Maharajikas, right? One of them are the Yakka Lord, uh, is the Yakka Lord. And so they hold a special place in the Sasana. So he happens to be one of them. 
And he comes, bows down to Lord Buddha and says, Bhante, uh, it is truly such a great fortune for the Vajis that the Blessed One, Vajis because Vajis are Lichavis in um, that region, uh, from where these monks, uh, at least a few of them, were. Um, that the Blessed One, the perfectly awakened Buddha, lives among them, as do his three sons of good families. Because that region is the Vajji kingdom, the Lichavis, princes, they live there. So it's a big honor that you live here now, as well as your three disciples, your three sons, in a sense. The Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Kimbila, and the Venerable Nandiya. So he was giving accolades because it's incredible. There will come a time where there will be no Dhamma in the world. You don't believe me? Even go, take a plane ride, go somewhere in the planet where there is no Dhamma. And there are many, many places. No Dhamma. It's dark. There's no sila. There's no samadhi. In fact, if you talk about the Dhamma, you will be persecuted. And no, they don't have to be in just in the Middle East or in some parts of Africa or some jungle somewhere. They don't necessarily only have to be there. They can also be found in traditionally Buddhist countries, sad to say where it has become old-fashioned, something passé, something not in keeping with the modern times. That is a dark, dark place where there's no Dhamma. We have the Dhamma here. What are we doing about it? What are we doing with it? So when you hear these suttas, I need you to be inspired enough to really dedicate even more of your life and time and energy into practicing properly. So, uh, by the way, this Diga Parajana Yakka also shows up in the Atanatiya Sutta as the protectors, one of the great generals who are protectors of the Sasana. And in the Atanatiya Sutta, the kings, the, the Deva gods, they say, Bhante, uh, please have your practitioners anytime they are in trouble. If a being comes and attacks them, uh, there's evil spirits, something you feel, the person feels, especially those who are practicing in somewhere far, in the jungle somewhere. And many yakkas, demons in this case, love to inhabit beautiful places where people don't go. They don't like people. And they don't like the Dhamma, they don't like the five precepts either. They like to kill, they like to steal, they like to engage in sexual misconduct. So when they see a person who's living purely, they will come and taunt that person to move them out of there. I've been to places like that. I couldn't believe it because it was so beautiful. Some islands, I'm not going to name names, but parts of the world where I've been to, you think this is heaven. You go there and you feel the strong, almost this invisible hand that's pushing against you, like, get out. And when you do, let's say, Namo Tassa Bhagavato, you feel like this opening around you. They push away, they pull away. They can't handle it because it's too powerful. Despite the environment, don't be fooled because it might be uh, occupied by some yakkas who don't like the Dhamma. So in the Atanatiya Sutta, you have Diga Parajana among other, uh, there's 28 yakka generals in fact, he's one of them, where the king of the yakkas is saying, Bhante, if any of your practitioners one day ever finds themselves in a difficult position like that, where they're being even attacked by the yakkas because that's something they do, also, not always, but sometimes they do. Just mention any of these yakka's names. Diga Parajana, if you can, that's it. There's, there's many of them also. Atanatiya Sutta is wonderful in that because it lists you names of devas and, and generals who will come after that evil spirit and tear him into pieces. 
They're terrified. They won't even get to touch them. They're so terrified from these generals or the devas even more. These are not, I'm not talking, you know, mythology. I'm not talking about non-existent things. These are, these are real. So, uh, but don't, pra don't worry. If you practice the five precepts, you're protecting yourself and your loved ones. You don't need some magical mantras or, or amulets to wear or some tattoos to be done on you. No, no, no. Keep the Dhamma in your heart. That is the biggest protection. Dhammo have rakkati dhamma chari. He who lives by the Dhamma is protected by the Dhamma. Don't worry. So, on hearing the jubilant words of the Yakka Diga Parajana, the terrestrial devas, they start now echoing the same statement that Bhante, it is truly such a great fortune for the Vajjis that the Blessed One, the perfectly awakened Buddha, lives among them, as do his three sons of good families, the Venerable Anuruddha, the Venerable Kimbila, and the Venerable Nandiya. So now the lowest devas we've heard, the same pattern actually happens in the Dhamma Chakka Pavattana Sutta as well, where when Venerable uh, An, um, Anya Kondanya he becomes a Sotapanna. The terrestrial devas are the first ones to know. And they just scream out this jubilant cry of joy. And then it moves up to the Chattu Maharajika realm. So that's what's going to happen next. And on hearing the terrestrial devas, the devas of the four great kings start echoing the same statement. And then their statements are heard by the Tavatin Saheven gods. They are much higher. The uh, uh, realm of uh, king, uh, the king of the gods, uh, Lord Sakka, uh, or Indra in Hinduism. And then after that, you have the uh, Tusita heaven, uh, and then you have that, the Nimanarati, which are the gods who love to create. They're just very lovey dovey, they're, they're always creating, they love things. Law of attraction, if you've ever heard of it, that is coming from them. Uh, uh, so, and then you have the gods who control them, their own creations. It's like the puppet masters or puppeteers. Um, and then eventually it goes all the way to the Brahma gods. So thus within that moment, in that short of an instance, the reputation and renown of those three venerable ones reached as far as the Brahma world. And the Blessed One addressed the Yakka Diga Parajana by saying, Indeed it is so, Diga, indeed it is so. For whatever clan these three sons of good families went forth from, if any of their immediate family members would recall these three with a happy and joyful heart, that recollection itself will surely conduce to their own benefit and happiness, as it will stay with them for a long time. If the immediate family members of these three Arahants, if they just hear about them, if they just recollect the fact that these three exist, that's going to cause them so much jubilation, happiness in their hearts for the rest of their lives. And he lists not just their immediate family, he also lists the next sentence is about the extended family members, bigger family members. And then he talks about the citizens of their village, native towns, their countries, their regions, and merchants and business people, who, if they can bring to mind the life and the purity of Venerable Anuruddha, Kimbila, and Nandiya, their lives will become so much better, even in that instance. And he lists all of them, including the Brahmins, including uh, the Kattiyas, the warrior kings. Therefore, Diga, if anyone in this entire world with its devas and humans, its recluses and brahmins, together with its maras, brahmas, would recall these three with a happy and joyful heart, that recollection itself will surely conduce to their own benefit and happiness, as it will stay with them for a very long time. After all, Diga, 
Those three sons of good families are living their lives while practicing for the happiness, benefit, and welfare of many beings, out of compassion for the entire world systems, for the happiness and well-being of both devas and humans. And that is what the Blessed One said, and the Yakka Diga Parajana was delighted in hearing the words of the Blessed One. Sadhu, Sadhu. I don't know about you, but hearing the story even now, it gives me such tremendous joy and happiness hearing about these three great Arahants. Doesn't matter. They were from different culture than mine, different language, different era. Who cares? Look at the beauty, look at the wonder of the Dhamma in their hearts. That's another way of understanding akaliko, timeless, timeless nature of the Dhamma. It gives us joy. We are not even related to them. It gives us so much joy to have had Venerables Nandiya, Kimbila, and Venerable Anuruddha. And this is another reason why we should really pay good respect and attention to the suttas. Because there's so much wealth there for us to discover, to improve our lives and to make the most of our presence here as human beings. So I will pause here and uh, hopefully there will be questions. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> yes, you have a question? Oh, <laughs> she has a lot of questions. <laughs> There's a sutta that mentioned the names of all the what yakas? Yes. The general yakas and what's that sutta? Atanatiya Sutta. It's from the long discourses, the Diga Nikaya. It's a, a sutta that often is uh, recited, but just like uh, last week's Ratana Sutta, if you remember, there's some suttas that traditionally have been used to ward off or push away evil spirits without people understanding why they're so powerful. So, uh, yeah, so this... What, what is that sutta number? Uh, the number I... Uh, huh? Atanatiya. Atanatiya sutta, but I don't recall the number. I have it. Uh, I've recorded it actually. Um, it's in the YouTube. It's in the Diganikaya, yes. I'm sorry? 32. Oh, 32. oh, 32, yes, thank you. But Did see, you? just yeah. now you mentioned that uh, when a person uh, achieved Nibbana already, already at Nibbana state, they, they, Jana is not equivalent to Nibbana. That one I'm clear. Hmm. But I also heard uh, some other sharing. I just want to clarify. They said that when a person already achieved Nibbana, they are perpetually in jhana state. They actually never get out of it. It's just that they could be in the lower jhanas. So I don't know whether it's... I just want to clarify. That is not true. I've never seen any... I've never seen anything in the suttas that say or indicate something similar to that. Because to come up with that conclusion... It's, so there's no support of it. I don't know. But probably it's a commentary or something like that. But it's not in the suttas. Um, I personally have never come across it all these years that I've been studying suttas. Uh, but, um, so it's, it's a conclusion based on wrong view. Um, uh, because to say that it is like a jhana, then a person who's experiencing a jhana can say, I'm actually experiencing a little bit of Nibbana. Think of it in numbers, right? So there's 15 and 15 here. There's an equal sign here. The 15 could, if you open it up, it could be 3 times 5, right? It could be 15 times 1, or here it could be 14 plus 1. <coughs> They're both 15. So if you look at it like in, that, in those terms, in deductive reasoning, uh, many people will use that. So it just opens up debates and arguments. It's based on wrong view, pure and simple. Because, uh, no, it's not. Uh, the, the, however, uh, 
what I do understand is uh, that when the Nibbanic experience does happen, the person, uh, first of all, cannot function from wrong view. Because remember, that is the very last Sanyojana. There's a higher or upper Sanyojanas, the upper fetters, that the Anagamin has to overcome. I mentioned to you, for example, restlessness, right? Another one is the desire for becoming, right? So into form realms, into formless realms, those are the other two. And then there's conceit, mana. That's a big one. I know better than you. I am better than you. Oh, you are equal to me. I am better or you are less than me or I am less than you. That mentality, comparing and contrasting, which is conceit. And then finally, the last Sangyojana or fetter is that of ignorance. None of these exist in the Arahant. Hence, the person is liberated. Why would you even want to be in a jhana? <laughs> but they actually, um, the, the jhanas and all the Arupa realms? No, not all of them. Okay, I mean, are those like prerequisites you need to go through to be able to achieve? <coughs> Is it a prerequisite? For? For Nibbana. No. No, they're not. Many, many people who had never experienced jhanas, but they attained Arahanship. Right. But I, from what I read and from the suttas and what they say is that some is by listening. The yes. Dhamma, right? So of I'm just course. wondering whether after they gone to that state, then they naturally can go to jhana. I, I, that's what I, I want. No, no, no. Because there are individuals who... See, there's different types uh, of individuals who have come to experience Nibbana. One of them, or the highest form of it, highest in the sense that, not that their Nibbana is different, because there's only one Nibbana. When a person experiences Arahanship, it is the same level of Nibbana as Lord Buddha's. Okay? That is what you are taking refuge in. When you're saying, you know, uh, when you're taking refuge in Lord Buddha. It's not Lord Buddha. It is the promise, the possibility, the probability of you also experiencing the same thing. Not Buddhahood, but Arahantship. As far as that is concerned, Nibbana is the same. Now, how a person experiences that could be different. For example, in the case of Venerable Sariputta, or Venerable Mahamuggallana, um, and some of the others, um, they have achieved it, attained it in both ways. They're called on both ways. They've attained it both ways. That means both in the way of the jhanas, meaning the eight jhanas that we went through, plus number nine. That has to be there. And through wisdom. And through wisdom. Those are the higher, highest quality of individuals or arahant. Uh, highest only as far as, you know, their ability to enter into jhanas. Because as an arahant, a person can choose to uh, enter into a jhana uh, just for fun. Because it's, it's a, you know, if you know several languages, uh, if you go to, let's say, if you know French, uh, and you go to Paris, and you want to order a meal, somewhere where there's no, no one who knows English or Bahasa or anything like that, or Chinese, and you know French, does that make your life easier? Can you get a meal ordered comfortably? Yeah. So it's like a, a tool, basically. Similarly, even in the case of Lord Buddha, uh, among others, of course, but Lord Buddha, when he was suffering severely from his backache before he died, he would enter into uh, the jhanas because it reduces, depending on which jhana you're entering. And uh, even at the moment of his death, he ent entered all of the jhanas and then came back. And then uh, <laughs> Vandabalananda constantly kept on saying, Oh, 
Lord Buddha is dead now. Now he died. Now, now he died. And Anuruddha says, no, Ananda, he's still here. He's in the first jhana. And then Ananda would wait. And then some time would pass and then Ananda would say, oh, Lord Buddha is dead now. Anuruddha would say, no, Ananda, he's in the seventh jhana. Remember how he knew where the other bhikkhus were? Same thing. He was watching the mind of Lord Buddha's. And Lord Buddha died between the fourth and the fifth jhana, as reported by Venerable Anuruddha. We know it from there. So you can go into the jhanas, because that becomes something that the arahant who entered both ways, who has the ability, can, can use that jhana. And uh, it's, it's a nice state if they want to. Sometimes uh, as Arahants, they might also want to or especially want to go into the, the Arhatta Pala state, which is a higher state than any of the, uh, including the ninth. Uh, that's the Arahant state. That's where Lord Buddha would go and sit and spend most of his afternoon. And so that, you know, I don't want to tell you too much or say things that can confuse you even more, but does that make sense? Hmm. But you do not need to have experienced the jhanas in order for you to experience Nibbana. However, having said that, uh, remember I was saying the jhanas are way stations, are places of rest, resting for the mind. Uh, it can give you this extra ability to kind of take the mind into a deeper state of comfort that is unprecedented. And of course, from one jhana to the next, it makes a huge difference. So in that sense, I agree with Bhante Punnaji when he would say um, how, uh, not completely agree, but it's, it's still there, there's truth in it, some truth where he would say the jhanas are like sleep rest. His intention, I understand, and that's why I agree with it to that extent, uh, for the role that the jhanas can give you that support like sleep does, but you have to come out of it sooner or later. And that is true. So that is another reason why I don't agree with that statement that you mentioned that jhanas are like mini, uh, like the Nibbana is like a mini jhana. It's not. Because the person cannot come out of arahantship. <laughs> In fact, the sotapanna cannot come out of sotapanna or sotapatti. But you definitely will come out of the jhana, whether you like it or not, sooner or later, when the factors are no longer there. So in that sense, it is very conditional. I hope that answers your question. Dear Venerable, uh, could you please uh, slightly, shortly elaborate with that what is the uh, Arupa Sanya? Hmm. Well, remember the um, what I mentioned about the Venerable Anuruddha going through the other states beyond the Rupa Jhanas. So, um, when this is different than vitakka vichara okay because you are beyond you are beyond the second jhana already so but people love to debate in concepts okay so you are dealing with forms there is ignorance so long as there is no arahantship taking place there are forms coming in in this case even if it's a formless Sanya, it is still Sanya, it is still Avidja. But people have written books, people have written treatises, people have done commentaries on stuff like this, because it keeps them busy and it keeps them away from the meditation cushion. For centuries, to this day, you have scholars, commentators talking about Sanya, whether it's Rupa or Arupa. But their level of ignorance is still unchanged. In fact, probably it's even thicker. So that is how I would approach it. Of course, somebody else might really give you more satisfactory response, perhaps, more intellectual. 
But I've never been a fan of intellectual acrobatics, I like to call it. I don't care because they never take me closer to Nibbana. So I hope that was somewhat satisfactory. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments? Yes? on Asuba meditation and Maranu Sati, mm. if you can. Uh, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, I have given a uh, talk on... Uh, well, I've talked about the um, uh, Mahasatipatthana Sutta, where I do talk about uh, uh, Asubas, uh, also the charnel ground, but I also talk about the uh, uh, Patama and Dutiya Maranusati suttas, suttas, both of them. Uh, I've done commentaries, I mean, videos uh, exploring these suttas, but in a nutshell, um, some teachers have incur discouraged lay people from practicing both. Asuba and Maranasati practices. I don't agree with that. It's up to the person. Now, if you are a newlywed couple where you have not enjoyed basically the life and the pleasures of lay people, I will definitely not encourage you to do either one, at least the Asuba, because every time you approach your spouse, you're going to see them inside out you're going to see the most disgusting parts of the body. You're going to see even yours. Because it will be one of the best tools to cut you loose from attaching to the things that the world loves attaching to. It is a powerful, a powerful method. And it is one that uh, is very much drenched in, with vipassana, with penetrative insight, because suddenly you're going to notice it everywhere. But like anything, like earlier I was saying, panya has to be present. There was one lady, and she was uh, meditating with one of the arahants. And uh, this is not in the suttas, this is from recent history in Thailand. And uh, she had been practicing Asuba. Asuba, by the way, is the repulsive. Uh, seeing the repulsive in what is not repulsive. So every time she would eat, somebody would put food on her table for her. Guess what she would see in front of her in the bowl, in the plate? What she would see in the bathroom. How it would end up coming out of her. Excrement. So she couldn't eat. So she had taken the asuba so deeply into her daily life where she could not see anything that was pleasurable. So she had obviously started to lose a lot of weight until somebody brought that to the attention of the teacher who happened to be, in her case, lucky case, fortunate because he was an arahant. And he calls her over and he... <laughs> disciplines her by chastising, yelling at her, telling her, what's wrong with you? You're not doing what I told you. Where is your panya? So he instructs her, now she starts to eat and she gains some composure. She understands because there is a limit. There's a way because you have to understand, why am I using this technique? Asubha. We use it when we are finding ourselves enmeshed in it, unable to detach ourselves from it. You see this with addiction patients or in toxic relationships where a person is attached to someone that means them harm. But every time they want to leave this person, they can't because they're too weak. They cannot separate themselves from this person or this addiction what to do. So then you have to bring in the opposite of that. So someone comes in and says, Bhante, I'm having a difficulty because I'm married, but I every time I see an attractive uh, man pass by or attractive woman pass by, 
that is pulling me out and I'm, I'm not thinking about my husband, I'm thinking about him or her. So one of the interesting things that I do, <laughs> depending on who they are, where they are on their practice, I say, what is the most attractive part of her body? Let's say, if it's the male asking. And they say, the waistline. I say, ah, where? Waistline. <laughs> So what's the range? Maybe 15 centimeters, 20 centimeters in height, okay? What is in that range other than what you see? Let's go deep. No, no, deeper. Bante, there's the intestines. Ah, what's inside the intestines? Oh, stop it, Bante, stop it. Why, what happened? Because you're ruining the image for me, Bhante. That's it. That's it. Whatever you're finding to be very physically attractive, go probe deeper, deeper than what you think you want to see. Suddenly the person goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Same thing. Same thing with food. If a person has an attachment to food, oh, I love, I don't know, strawberries, the person might say. Okay, let's leave the strawberries outside for five days. What is going to happen to the strawberries? These beautiful, red, delicious, sweet, organic, tiny little fungi are going to grow. Ones that are poisonous to you, by the way. And it's going to go smushy, gray, things are going to start walking on it. Can you eat those strawberries? No. Now when the person is eating it, about to eat, that is something, an image that I would introduce. But the person has to be ready. Now, I will not do this, I will not instruct this to a person who is anorexic, who I have to convince to eat. So similarly with uh, Maranasati, I think we all, in a way, did Maranasati for the past two and a half years, but we never were realizing that we were doing it. We were so attached to the body. It was perfect time to do Maranasati, but we wanted to attach ourselves to it. So I would bring it up again and again in my talks over the, over the last two and a half years. Why, why are we so attached to, oh, saving the body, saving, putting a mask on all the time, 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 all the time. All the time. <laughs> Okay, okay, why? Because I don't want to get sick, I don't want to get sick, I don't want to get sick. Okay, you didn't get sick, but let's say you don't get sick for 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. Are you going to get sick later? Yeah. You're going to die. <gasps> don't say that. Why not? Do you know something I don't know? Do you know anyone who's lived forever? Everybody's going to go out of this place dead. I heard one time a person say, in 100 years, this whole planet will be empty of all of the occupiers, uh, all occupiers, all the people that are on it, that are alive now, in 100 years, they're not going to be there. There will be new people, other generations, of course, but all those who are alive, they're all going to be dead. So the ridiculousness of the fear, oh, oh I don't want to get sick. It's stupid, ultimately. But you have an eco economical system that is based on consumerism and globalism, where they now have us like this. Not just one country, the whole planet. Whatever they want, we will do as they decide. But we have to have wisdom. So Maranasati would be working beautifully whenever you notice that you are attached to wanting to keep this body so-called healthy and safe. Healthy and safe for what? That's another question. To, so that you can go and enjoy more pleasure? Right? That's what we had become, right? Maximization of pleasurable experiences and minimization of negative ones, right? Sounds familiar? So that's not living with the Dhamma. 
So Marana Sati would be perfect for every single one of us who is so attached to keeping this body healthy, not getting sick. As if we're going to live forever. Which by the way says that I'm not practicing Lord Buddha's teachings. If I believe in that thought, that I want to keep myself safe and healthy all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. What happened to Anicca? Do you know something that Lord Buddha didn't know? Because that's what you're saying when you're always wanting to keep the body healthy. Take it easy. Take it easy. Relax. Don't be attached. I mean, so many people I see are attached to the mask as if it's an extension of their skin. It, that's how ridiculous it has become. Sometimes I ask people who come to see me, are you wearing the mask for yourself or for me? No, it's a legitimate question. I want to ask, because I don't want them to take the mask off if they feel uncomfortable for themselves. But when they say, no Bhante, I'm doing it for you, I say, no, no, don't worry about me, because I'm going to die. I don't know about you. <laughs> you can take it off. <laughs> take it off. And they say, are you sure? Are you yeah. Do you have a major sickness? No? Okay, take it off. Breathe and get some oxygen to that brain because you have been depriving your brain of oxygen. Because all these people at uh, other places in, in America and all that, they don't, they claim to be talking science, but they don't know anything about science apparently. I taught science for over 10 years. You put something, an obstruction on your face, you're depriving your brain of very valuable oxygen. You don't want to do that. And doing that with children, that is, the, that is criminal. That is criminal. So we have to teach Maranasati in a healthy way. And using that would be one method of explaining it. Um, but that whatever I just shared with you in no way does justice to what we can uh, extract from uh, the teaching that Lord Buddha gave in respect to Maranasati. It is one of the most uh, powerful tools to overcome attachment to the body, to our concepts, to our sannyas. Because so many people go to, uh, used to go to charnel grounds, now cemeteries. Try going to a cemetery if you can. It's fun. It's good. And because you will meet your fears very quickly, especially when there's no one around you. <laughs> I never heard of, I've never seen, I've never experienced myself. I've been to, you know, cremation grounds. I've, I've been to in Nepal. I went to actually when they were burning an actual human being and tossing some over there and there were some pieces of the body that was not going because the water was not strong enough and they didn't burn the bodies thoroughly. So you see that. But then even later on, like cemeteries, when you go, I've never heard of anyone who died because someone attacked them like a ghost. <laughs> Never in any book have I seen any, any sutta where a ghost or some entity came and attacked a human being while they were walking in the cemetery or a funeral pyre. You hear dogs, but the dogs are too busy eating something or taking some food that's left over or something. You hear people who are digging I remember when I was a child, uh, uh, they would bury, as, as Christians, you know, they bury. And sometimes you would hear about uh, someone who, and in, the, in that custom, they, you know, in that culture, Armenians, for example, they, in the old days, people, if they had money and they didn't want to keep, let's say, gold or money, money in the house, to carry it with you, they would turn the tooth into gold, right? So gold tooth. So they would bury the person with their gold teeth, right? Thinking that the person is going to go and meet, I don't know, God or something with the gold or something, you know. But what we found out later was that the cemetery owners, attendants, they would 
somehow, oh yeah, they would dig it up and they had tools to extract the gold. You would have human beings basically moving about in the cemetery, not hungry ghosts. <laughs> So I would be more cautious of human beings because you never, ever, ever, I've never heard of any ghosts coming and haunting or killing a person in a cemetery because you have everything that they're desiring but they can never get in that form. But it's our fear, that's what I'm saying, you will meet your sannyas. So in that sense, it's a wonderful tool also for that purpose. Maranasati, the death, contemplation, because how many times have you died? We forget countless innumerable eons we have come and gone. You have seen death, you have experienced death countless times. But we're still afraid of death, Bhante. We have amnesia. <laughs> We don't remember our deaths. And that pretty much tells you why we are so caught in samsara. And Dhamma is the way out. The only way out. The only way out. Lord Buddha's path is the only way out to cut your cord to samsara. Do it. Because each of us is responsible for us. No matter how much you love your son, your daughter, your loved ones, you will not be able to save anyone. You can help them to save themselves by encouraging them, but by living it yourself, showing them the changes and the transformations that are happening in your life through the Dhamma. Trust the behavior, right? So I will stop here. So let us share some merits. Akasa tachabhumata deva nagama hindika punyam tanganumoditva chirangra kantu loka sasana Akasa tachabhumata deva nagama hindika Punyan tanganamoditva chirangra kantu desanam Akasa tachabhumata deva nagama hindika Punyan tanganamoditva chirangra kantu mamparanti Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu May you be well. May the triple gems blessings be upon you and your loved ones.